So today we are going to be talking about emotional intelligence, as Alia mentioned, and our speaker is going to be Derek, and that's a great honor considering all his accomplishments and how it is not so easy to get a hold of a busy man. So I will just go through his profile, Derek Karibu, he's already here with us. So I'll just go through Derek's profile. Um, Derek is a trainer, a coach, a facilitator with his uh, company Public Image, where he supports organizations and individuals for high performance. He has trained and worked with hundreds of individuals and teams, helping leaders and entrepreneurs and executives to develop effective interpersonal skills uh, through acceleration of their um, professional, past and personal um, success. Um, by helping them promote their emotional intelligence, leadership and communication, executive presence skills, he has increased their earning potential. And Derek is a regular contributor of the media, giving advice on being seen, heard and remembered for the right reasons, not just for the sake of it. And he's a regular contributor to magazines and newspapers. So apart from, he got his degree from SHU University in Connecticut, USA and an MBA from the Helsinki School of Economics, I, I, said, I hope I said that right, in Finland. He's a graduate of Strathmore Business School, uh, Enterprise Development Program, and is a certified emotional intelligence practitioner with Genius International. He previously worked as a financial analyst with in New York, and uh, Derek will tell us that one, the Risk Institute in France, and worked as a communication strategist with London-based cons consultancy, Africa Practice. So in, in addition to that, the finer detail, if you didn't know, he's also, uh, to, uh, on top of training and coaching, Derek is a keynote speaker at conferences, launches, and sales meetings, and he's also a corporate host and moderator, and he's an ambassador with the Pan-African, Pan African Advocacy Group Africa and a qualified person in So, Derek, thank you for accepting our invitation and being here with us. And that's quite an impressive uh, profile. <laughs> so, Karibu, let's just try and get to know you a bit more. So, uh, from my behind the scenes, I also discovered that you are in the space of finance and all this, then public image, now you're on emotional intelligence, and also so tell us a bit more, why all the diversity and uh, many, many skills? Okay, well, first of all, good afternoon, so thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here, in spite of the hiccups that the country experienced as a whole this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that at least some of us are able to make it. And your question about my background, well, you know what, I was living life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. I can say that. And for me, there's, there was nothing better than being able to travel, live, work, and experience different countries, different cultures, mm -hmm. in order for me to, I think, become the best version of myself, which hopefully I am here today. <laughs> so all of those experiences have added up to bringing me to where I am, dealing in you know, emotional intelligence, you mentioned that. And uh, I don't regret anything that I have done in my past. In fact, if anything, if I could do it over again, I would. Okay, that's awesome and intriguing at the yeah. same time. So um, let me just introduce you to our audience. Uh, uh, yep. A bit. So uh, the invite was mostly to groups of special needs caregivers. This is for right. caretakers or also people who support the family in terms of therapists and the doctors at large. And um, uh, just so you know, we will be we've recorded. We're going to we we'll be recording this so that at least we can share with those who maybe power hasn't mm -hmm. come back on their side, and then at least they can be able to join us later. So one of the things as parents, me being a parent also, and walking this journey, we are all facing these challenges because of uh, COVID-19. And you can see different families from the groups of interactions that we've had. And also last time, there is so much that has changed both for us and our children. 
And uh, I'm seeing a lot of parents who are saying, I'm tired, I want to give up, when will this end? So you can imagine that means if a regular human being is going through a tough time. So a special needs parents, most, of the, most likely is going through the same, but amplified like 10 to 100 times. So one of the challenges that we are having uh, as, as our fraternity, that is we have a lot of loss. This is in terms of support. You find like a lot of us don't have close family and single parents uh, majority. And apart from that, now our support system, which is the therapist and the education school and all that has been now been taken away. And we are trying to have 20,000 balls in the air and we're trying to have everything under control. So that's where I think that frustration and uh, fatigue is coming from as caregivers. You find we don't even have access when it comes to learning for our children. And uh, you're still hearing like everyone else is going on with school. So it's like double. And the problem with that also, with that accessibility limitation, you find that uh, our children are not accessing therapy. Right, and therapy is ground a grounding factor that keeps them still enough for us to be able to do a lot of the interventions that are there. So you're fearing that you're losing time. We are looking at regression. A lot of parents are already experiencing this regression, especially in behaviors of children. And um, every day is a, a, a new challenge. Uh, the things are evolving because you find like the children now are trying to also adopt to the changes and try to embrace what what they cannot even understand in the first place. And you'll find also, especially the ones who are non-verbal, it's also a different story altogether. That's just to give you, in a nutshell, what we're going through uh, as caregivers. So how do, we, how do we keep them together enough to be able to sail through this? How do we keep them together enough so that they're able to deal with all these changes that are being thrown at them by life, while life was already hard enough? And this one didn't even come with a warning. <laughs> okay, well, you know, thank you for at least sharing the background of this group. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine what uh, you as parents and caregivers for children with special needs are going through. And as a matter of fact, just, you know, we're a small group here now. Maybe some people will join us later. I just wanted to find out, mm -hmm. because I deal in this sort of area of managing emotions in fact, we say the definition of emotional intelligence is managing, expressing, and perceiving your own emotions, okay. what you're going through, what's going through in your head, mm -hmm. um, so that you can have a positive outcome, but also a positive outcome in other people that you are interacting with. And so I want to find out, mm -hmm. uh, what has your week been like? If you could use one word or maybe two words to describe the emotions that you have gone through this week what would be the let's do let's make it the top three emotions that you have experienced this week and i don't know how you want to do this survey just allow people to yeah, yeah, unmute we, their we, mics and talk and we'll, I will we're a small group uh yeah, yeah like because we're small let's make it as intimate and as interactive yeah. as possible so you can choose to either put it in the comments or you can unmute and tell us uh, so on the chat box, uh, we can see uh, if you're shy that is, but since we are few, it will be good to just speak, like what are the emotions that you have gone through? Personally, I know I've gotten frustrated. Okay, so oh, yeah. frustration, was, yeah. Yeah, there was frustration, there was anger at some point. Anger, okay. Then there was compassion also. Frustration, anger and compassion, okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone else? For me, I'm a special needs teacher. It's really hard. Parents Who is, are calling. Is that Isaac? Yeah. Yes, it's me. Yeah. Isaac. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm a caregiver at uh, mm -hmm. Econ Special Detorious. Mm -hmm. uh, parents have been calling, calling. My class uh, parents have been calling. I don't know what mm -hmm. to tell them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this week has been tough for me. So, but what did you feel if you could use, because one of the things we talk about in EI is being able to increase your emotional vocabulary. You have to begin to self-awareness, which I'll talk about, is begin to express yourself. And even with those children who are going through um, these unique sort of set of circumstances, beginning to describe what they're feeling. So how would you describe your, your own emotions, Isaac? My own emotions, I get, I get headaches sometimes. 
and I also feel a bit weak. Okay, so you feel weak? Yeah. You get headaches? I, um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to encourage okay. you to sort of self-aware, look back over the week. When you got that yeah. headache, what did you feel apart from weakness? What else did you feel? What did you, what was your mood? My mood was a bit down. Okay, yeah. so maybe you felt a little bit depressed, sad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. I, I, I don't want us to suddenly wallow in some of these, uh, un, I'll call them unproductive emotions, but it's good that you're beginning to bring them out. Okay, anybody else can share again? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Someone else, Carol, Mary, Nokia, my fellow namesake, Sylvia, Rosalind. What were your emotions so that at least we have something to work with? Yes, Mary. Hello. Yes, Mary, yes. Hi, it's Carol. Yes, Carol. So for me, I would say I've been feeling so overwhelmed. Overwhelmed? Very, sometimes, sometimes very angry. Like anger. Uh, mm -hmm. anger of like people around me, like I'm feeling like they're not feeling me, you know? And also a lot of frustration, like things okay. are not going the way I want them to go. Yeah, I would say so that. The over Sorry, Carol, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please go ahead and finish. So I would say, I would say frustration, anger, overwhelmed. Yeah, and even depressed at times. Okay. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Someone else? Do we have someone else who can share what the, what the emotions for this week has been like? Thank you, Perpetua, for joining us. We, maybe you can tell us as a therapist uh, to just bring you up to speed. We're discussing the emotions that we have gone through this week. Like, what, what have you felt? What kind of emotions have you gone through during the week? Okay, great. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, yeah, so for me, the emotions, um, the first few weeks were tense, so I wouldn't lie, I didn't do the panic shopping. I participated in the panic shopping. I participated in spending lots of hours watching the news, watching the TV. Uh, so the first few weeks were like that for me. But as I progressed, I noticed that uh, it is not changing soon. <laughs> <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had to change. So lately it is a bit quite relaxed, but now with the lockdown for areas, then now there's a bit of tension. Yeah. <laughs> so if we look at the last week, since last Saturday, what are the three overwhelming emotions that you have experienced or that you can remember or that you can recall since last Saturday? Papetro? Carol, have we lost her? Oh, was it Carol? Sorry, I can't. That even... was Papetro. That oh, was Papetro. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I would say anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, anger, mm -hmm. And confusion. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Silver, maybe on the chat. More, and... Yeah, I have okay. one on the chat. Right. And uh, on the chat, we have disappointment. This is from Rosalie. She says disappointment, mm -hmm. and she's wondering when things will ever change and if it's going to change for the better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's from her side. Okay. So maybe let me just talk a little bit about how emotions are processed in the, in the brain. So our brain is made up of structures like the amygdala, which is at the base of your head, or literally the base of your brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which is at the front of your head or the front of your brain. Now, what happens when an event occurs? So I'm going to give an example or three examples of events. Okay, number one, you have a conversation with somebody and they say something to upset you. 
that event is tagged by that emotional part of the brain, the amygdala, mm -hmm. as a negative emotion. Okay, uh, let me use an example of another negative event. Let's just say, and this is probably not a good example, but I'll use it, all right? As I'm sitting here, uh, say a, a, a snake had been hiding up in the, in the ceiling, trying to get warm, and then all of a sudden it falls on my laptop or on my table, right? So that event instantly will create that negative emotion. It's tagged by the amygdala. Actually, it's a way of preserving ourselves as a species, as human beings. We have had that um, sort of that tag to protect us because you would probably jump away or recoil to protect yourself. What happens actually is the amygdala then sends unconsciously or subconsciously without even us being conscious um, a message to the front of our heads, which is where the prefrontal cortex is. And that's where our decision-making process is. And then we make a decision. So we make a decision to run away. We make a decision to uh, respond back because you feel somebody, or, you know, in this environment, you know, maybe you, the Jumia rider isn't wearing a mask and he's handing you something and you want to recoil because that instinct is based on the, the amygdala hijack. Now, Trouble with those negative emotions is that they narrow our thinking. They limit our options and we react literally instinctively. So instead of perhaps making options or decisions which perhaps would be better for us in the long run, remember the definition of emotional intelligence is to help us. We perhaps make a decision that yes, maybe it protects us, but may not be perhaps a better decision because our brain is restricted because of how this information is relayed to the prefrontal cortex. I don't want to get too scientific. But conversely, if we feel a positive emotion, so something great happens, all right, then the prefrontal cortex instead will make uh, a decision based on the fact that we're now thinking more creatively. We're now thinking, we call it laterally, broadly. We're now looking for more options. We're not constricted. So what we're trying to do here in terms of managing our emotions is how do you take that negative event? That one you can't change. You can't change COVID-19. I can't change somebody talking to you badly. I can't change, you know, a snake that has been hiding in my ceiling and drops onto my table. You know, I can't get rid of all the matatus. They're the ones which drive me crazy. Okay, you can't change for, for, for you the situation that you're in, having to be caregivers for, you know, children with special needs. But you can change the emotional component your reaction. So some of the emotions you've shared with me, anxiousness, worry, whatever you've gone through this week, how did you um, respond to that negative emotion in a way that was, to use the word, intelligent? What did you do when you felt anger? Did you give up? Did you, um, um, you know, were you aggressive, you know? Did you uh, lash out? Whatever it is. So that's, I think, the crux of where I'm coming from is how to manage these strong emotions that we're feeling. All right, I'll stop talking right there. I don't want to lose anybody getting into the rabbit hole. But if there are any questions, again, we're a small group. I'm happy to clarify them. Sylvia, over to you. Okay, so we have, uh, we have two more comments. So we have Mary who says uh, they felt fearful, disappointed, mm -hmm. and angry. I can see anger is a lot, a lot of us are annoyed. So at mm -hmm. least uh, we have Sho who has broken it down a bit more. So she says, hi, this week I felt frustrated that I'm not able until now to, to get support for my child in terms of money transfer, which is something the government should be doing uh, under social protection, and even the other packages being given in the communities currently. So I believe that's under social services. And uh, she's angry that people are not taking this thing seriously. And so the lives of our kids are not going back to normal soon. So that's, that's the, the, the other emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, also someone says that they're, great, they're grateful that the sun has stayed well so far, because that's one of our- Thank you, fears. a positive emotion, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so those, those, those emotions normally come, they come and go. And I believe it's mostly because of what we are dealing with. So something like our children, our special needs children, is something that's beyond our control. But you see, we always have this feeling of why me? And then there is how people react to our children. 
uh, so that's that's another source of anger for us as caregivers most of our kids might not process it all right and get affected by it but for me as a caregiver who understands the environment and understand that my child needs to be treated equally like everyone else it angers us when people mistreat neglect um, and also discriminate against our own children so okay. in this in, in this context maybe i might pose it as a form of a question um as a caregiver should i react to okay. these events or should i uh should i just you know, ignore it. The way you're saying it's about our reaction to it. So how, how should we deal so that we, we change our focus, like you say, so that it's a bit positive now? Okay. Uh, yeah, great question, uh, Sylvia. And the obvious question, I can't speak to what the government is doing. I can't speak to the situation that you find yourselves in. What I can speak to is to how to handle the anger that you're going through, the anxiousness and the stress. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of strategies. One of them, for example, is what we call creating space for you to process that emotion. Actually, let me take a step back. Mm -hmm. The first thing is to recognize what that emotion is, labeling that emotion. That's actually the, one of the main tenets of emotional intelligence. It's called self-awareness. What I would um, suggest, particularly for the people in this group, is that begin to write down those strong emotions that you feel and write them down on a regular basis. So it could be once a day, twice a day, maybe in the morning when you get up, in the evening at the end of the day. And just like how you've expressed them to me here, if you start writing to yourself and you go back over the last 12 hours or 24 hours and mm, I felt angry, I did this. I felt stressed, I did this. I felt this. Writing down those emotions actually give, begins to give you a roadmap of how to deal with them. Because the next thing you're going to do is say to yourself, okay, I was angry and I did this. As you reflect, because now you're not in the, caught up in the moment, you may say to yourself, well, actually, that was a wasted uh, decision that I made based on that anger. Maybe I could have done something more positive. I'm not saying not to feel emotions. All emotions are important. They're data. It's a price of living. But how you can react to it, how you can reframe it, perhaps is a step towards dealing with it in a more emotionally intelligent way. So if I feel anger, write that down, say to myself, okay, the next time I'm going to feel anger, rather than just lashing out or you know, behaving in a way that might be considered unproductive, let me try something else. So that writing down is creating that space. And I know it's easy for me to say that, but in the moment, honestly, I bring this in my life, Mm -hmm. Somebody will say to me something that makes me angry. Those matatus will drive me up the wall because of the way they drive. I've already that proactive strategy in my head. Now, you're a matatu, it's going to do that. There are no two ways about it. I can't get rid of all the matatus. I can't change the event. The event is external, but I can change my decision. So my decision, instead of lashing out at the matatu driver and yelling at him, as I used to do, is maybe to create that space and say, just let me breathe. Or empathize or resilience, which I think perhaps a lot of us need. Okay. Enable those emotions, begin in your own way to say, what is the best way for me to act on that emotion in the moment? Okay. So we have also, um, someone says that they're feeling anxious because they're trying to embrace mm -hmm. this time to teach the child mm -hmm. how to take a shower by himself. Remember for us, our children are very dependent on us. So 80% of the activities, if they have not achieved the milestone, it still now falls squarely uh, on us as caregivers. Um, and then there is, um, there is a neighbor, she says, uh, sorry, state, a neighbor say these kids referring to my son, don't make it mm -hmm. life you know, so of course that's, that's, I can only imagine how that goes down. If, if she's still not mm -hmm. in jail, then that means she managed it so well. Some of us would be arrested by now. <laughs> so we have uh, Rosalyn who says, when I wonder about whether things will be better, I feel so helpless. So what do I do? I just live on, just remain alive. Is there another way I can handle this emotion? Please help. Okay. Um, I'm, that last part you said, that the person wonders whether they can continue living on. Was that what they said? 
Um, no, she's Sorry. saying they just live on. Do they just live on, just remain to remain alive, or is there another way they can handle the emotions, like ignore it and just move on, or do you do something? What other alternatives? Okay. Let me let me say again. This is not about ignoring the emotion. What I want you to do instead is be intentional with how you act on that anger or worry or, you know, whatever strong emotion that you are feeling. Mm -hmm. Those emotions are important because they help us survive in this world. Now, if you are with special needs child who is constantly making you feel anxious, mm -hmm. the result is that anxiousness is going to have a long-term effect on you. Okay. It's having an effect of you, I think, in the short term, because perhaps you're not able, as I said, your, your thinking is, your creative thinking is restricted. And so you're not able to see the options. So what I want you to do is take that anxiousness. It's there. You can't change the situation. But rather than making a decision to do something unproductive in the moment when you feel anxious, like say to yourself, you know what, I give up. That's not a productive decision to make because you feel anxious say to yourself let me take that anxiousness what can i do can i turn that access anxiousness around and instead the more productive act would be to become more engaged start looking for solutions joining groups like this where you can have this conversation rather than saying ah it is what it is what i can there's nothing i can do do you see the difference mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so again everybody has individual circumstances that they're going through, even though you all have sort of the same, um, the same issue because you're all dealing with special needs and you're all caregivers. But individually, what can you do with that particular child that works in your favor? And literally the solutions are as many as they are those emotions. For me, exercise, watching what I eat, managing my sleep. That's how I deal with anxiousness and worry. Mm -hmm. So those are literally physical things that I can do so that I'm not waking up in the middle of the night saying, oh my God, COVID-19, it's at Malaysia. Because I don't want to feel that way. Mm -hmm. I want to take that anxiousness, convert it, and what do I do? I watch what I eat. I watch what, uh, how much I sleep, making sure I get enough sleep. I cut off um, social media in certain respects. In other words, I don't watch the news every day. Somebody just called me today and asked me what's going on. I said, I have no idea because I don't feast on the news. And that's something practical I can do because it will just feed my anxiousness or worry. But, um, you know, for uh, speaking from a special needs caregiver's perspective, yeah. There is um, the anxiety. Let me address maybe now the anger. Like what, 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 what our fellow parent was told by, or then what the comment the neighbor made, right? Yeah. So at that point, you practically want to throttle someone because of the level of ignorance, considering yeah, sure. all the, the effort you're putting to try and give the best to your child, to try and make your child get to those uh, milestones. Then someone comes here and just sticks this mold of negativity when we're trying so hard to have awareness so that there, there is inclusion, at least there is some, some humanity of whatever is remaining of it in this day and age. So at that point, like, well, how do you deal? You know, that instant anger, like you said, it just goes straight back and you react. I know there's a friend of mine who's been arrested in half time because the next thing is just pick up a hockey stick and give you a thorough beating because of not watching your mouth. But you see, you cannot control everyone's ignorance and for lack of a better yes. word. You know. Yeah. So how, how would be the appropriate way of dealing with such um, outside, in, like someone is transferring their, their views onto you and your family and your child at that moment. Okay, so Silva, your, part of the answer was in your question, is that you mm -hmm. can't change somebody's ignorance. Mm -hmm. You can't change that. People will say and they will act the way that they do. What you can do is begin to take care of yourself. Begin to mentally to develop resilience. Begin to develop the capacity to recover from and adapt to challenging situations. Resilience can be cultivated. It's like a muscle. It can be built up. And there are many pathways to developing that resilience. I've talked about some of these practical examples. Don't 
and again, you know, I'm saying this, everybody's situation is different in terms of, it's easy for me to say, get enough sleep. Yeah. But you have to find a way of doing that. You've got to find a way of making sure that you're eating the right foods to help you deal with your mind. And I'm not kidding. These things are so important. You've got to find a way of strengthening your body's immune system um, through what you eat to help you deal with the comments that come from somebody who is ignorant. Have a plan. When you're in an airplane, this a disaster. Sorry, one second. Um, Mandy, please mute your, mute your microphone and Beatrice because we're having a lot of interactions on your side. Yes, continue, Derek, please. No, they say, I mean, they say when you're on an airplane, when you're being given the uh, instructions in the unlikely event of the plane experiencing um, an accident, mm -hmm. you're told when the mask drops is that you have to fix the mask on yourself first, the oxygen mask, mm -hmm. before you fix it onto your young child that you're traveling with. Mm -hmm. You have got to take care of yourself. And when I say take care of yourself, take care of yourself mentally. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have got to be able to develop proactive strategies of dealing with these things because that situation is not going to change. Part of that is be open to embracing and taking in new ideas to develop these resilience, uh, resilient strategies, finding the strength um, through some of the things that we are discussing today. Then, so the one of the things that we find as a conflicting, for lack of a better word, point of interest is like the way you're saying, yes, I understand it starts with me. But then you see our children are almost fully dependent on us, right, as caregivers. So that, that's disconnecting that my child is an entity, I am an entity, while 80% you are more like uh, two peas in a pod where one can't live without the other. So adjusting and deciding on who's more of a priority between your child and yourself becomes one of the challenges that we have to make, the decisions that we have to make. And it, it throws a spanner in the works now, like in what you're saying, like I have to sleep. I'll give you an example. The other day, the baby was not feeling well. I, they're not verbal because most of our, uh, a good number of our children cannot speak. So I cannot figure out why, why, why they're uncomfortable or uh, they cannot tell you exactly where the pain is. So you see, you have to be very vigilant, very awake and alert. And at the same time, you've already had a very long day dealing with everything else. And here is this small person or big person who fully depends on you. So for us, that's the complex. Yeah, you know, so it's not selfish taking care of yourself. Taking good care of yourself is one of the ways to stay strong for those who depend on you. It is the pathway to resilience. The only way that you can develop these proactive strategies, mm -hmm. let me rephrase that again. The only way that you can develop ways of dealing with strong emotions that come with being in a situation where you're taking care of somebody else is by cultivating these pathways to resilience. You have got to find a way of dealing with that anxiousness. And, and you know, playing the blame game, for example, is not necessarily the most effective way. Yeah, there are times when you need to vent, but you can't change that situation. So you have to find those reserves in yourself about how am I going to deal with this worry, anxiousness, stress that I'm going through. And it starts with yourself, creating that space, reframing the story, taking that anxiousness and that worry and instead using it to help you become more engaged. And sure, there'll be days when you're like, you know what, I can't. Leon Mishindo. Mm -hmm. But you dust yourself off, you get up off the ground and you start all over again. Okay. Your dependents need you to be strong. They don't need you to have that worry and that anxiousness going through the head and saying, you know what, this situation is, is hopeless. And again, maybe it might be easy for me to say, but this is what my challenge to you is. You have got to find the ways of, of doing that. Okay. So Perpetual is asking, are there any tools parents can access to walk them through emotional intelligence? 
okay, we're talking about walking you, the caregivers, not yeah. the parents. I mean, not the dependents. Yeah. yeah, there are many tools. Conversations with people like myself. There is a myriad, I think, of uh, information on online. Um, but some of the tools that I'm discussing today, I want to make it simple because these are what we, I call common sense strategies. They're common sense because we know them, but perhaps we haven't been intentional in terms of how we use them. Like the things I'm talking about, sleep, eat, food, exercise. But you would be surprised at how if you really double down on some of those, how it will really help you when you're up at 11 o'clock at night or midnight because your child has refused to sleep. The fact that you got that exercise earlier in the day and you made time for that will give you the wherewithal has created that pathway for you to deal with this child who's refused to sleep and is acting up at one o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, so now when we're looking at that, uh, there are times when we have so much that's going, but how, mm -hmm. uh, how do we readjust? You see, like when there is a lot of pressure, like you said, when there is a lot, you're reacting. So you do not have enough time to like really break it down. So, and, and, um, so right now we have the COVID-19, we have the restrictions on top of it about movement, mm. about masks, maybe you need to go out to the store, you cannot go out to the store, you can't leave your child because you don't have that support system because um, you find most have had to let go of their child minders for budgetary restrictions for the sake of uh, protecting the children and stuff like that. So when you're at that point, you know, like the baby screaming, this is running out, like, for example, what she said, the things she's feeling and anger and all of them put together. So how do you trigger yourself to realize, okay, uh, this, this is the time that I need to take a step back and now maybe apply the tools we're talking about? Do we have like telltale signs, physical signs that we should watch out for that would be yep. indicators that you're about to fall off, you know, the grid? That's a great point, Sylvia. Talking about sensations in the body. One of the exercises that I do, particularly when I'm working with my clients, is begin to uh, scan your body. And because whatever feelings that you're going through, anger, happiness, anxiousness, will manifest itself in terms of certain sensations within the body. And again, this is just the self-awareness that I'm talking about. So in the moment, if you're feeling anger, where is that anger manifesting itself? Is it manifesting itself maybe in the hands? Is it manifesting itself by feeling that your fingers are tingling or your feet? And tuning into yourself. Now, again, in the moment when your child is screaming, who has time to sort of you know, get into yourself and start feeling where those sensations are coming from. But being able, because what you want to do is not reflect after the event. I want you to do that. But if after the event you say to yourself, I could have done this, I should have done this. But in the moment, I was just acting on instinct. Then it becomes, what is that definition of insanity? Just doing the same thing over and over again and, you know, expecting different results. What we want to do, you're in the moment and perhaps things are not going well for you, but as you begin to reflect back on that moment, as you write down what you are feeling, what you decided to do, start asking yourself, okay, what could I have done better? How do, what outcome do I want and what do I need to do? And remember, you're not dealing with the event. You can't change the event, but you can change what is going through in here. That amygdala hijack going through here. What do I need to do to deal with that anger? In the moment so that the next time it happens again instead of reacting instinctively whatever you do when you're really in the moment and you're angry because things are out of your control you instead have you know have a strategy that you already thought about before to 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 help yourself okay uh patricia applauds that she says uh how how, how to get out of it which i believe at least you've addressed um then uh for us now in in this in this space um we need to take a breather amidst everything 
just just to try and see what you said right like take a bit a breather in the moment since maybe your personal reaction would come like when we're talking about assessing at the end of the day what did i feel how did i react so that it's not too late because sometimes the reactions can be very simultaneous um the other question is like uh there is the certain fear of the unknown right now that we have because uh, on top of everything, there is that fear of like, oh my God, what if my baby reacts this way? Because of, of, of uh, when they go back to school, will they be able to catch up? Will they have forgotten? Because this is a place we haven't been there before. And um, with, with the factors that we went through of all the things that are adjusting and are not playing our way. So how, how do we deal and try and control your mind in terms of you don't go crazy with the what ifs? I know you say, don't worry. I also personally be, believe that um, worrying is like sitting on a rocking chair and hoping to get to Kisumu when you're still on the same spot. So how would you guide for us to be able to handle that? Not so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I want to do, I, let me ask you, for example, when you have been f in situations personally uh, with your children mm -hmm. where, you know, things were out of control in the moment. And I'm answering mm -hmm. this question, mm -hmm. but also part of the last question. Okay. When things went better than expected mm -hmm. in the moment, what did you, what did you do? Not when things completely spiraled out of control, but when things went better than expected or better than could be hoped. In the moment, what did you do? There was, of course, the feeling of anxiety. For example, like uh, in, my, in, in the context, um, let's say there was a meltdown and you communicate and the baby actually responds to what you said, like calm down, stop screaming, let's do this. Okay. There is relief. So, sorry, sorry, Xavier, I'm just going to hold you there because yeah. you, I want us to get this. Uh -huh. So in the moment when the child was having a meltdown, uh -huh. you actually were able to interact with your child you try and speak to them and they, and they calm down I'm, I'm talking about the instances when things went well yes now for us that is going well when they actually listen and uh, they they calm down that is um, one of the small things that we celebrate because that means you're communicating they're able to process it okay so so that that's a that's a plus All and right. what was the what what was going through your head what was the emotion what were you feeling frustration and anger no, when things As went well. reaction, then there was excitement, like, thank you, Jesus, like he finally had, <laughs> you know, we are, we are getting so, somewhere. So you took a, an actual step to convert the frustration, the anger, to actually excitement and happiness that the baby calmed down. Now, that was one case in the moment, and I'm sure the next day they were acting up again. But the crux of emotional intelligence is to build your reserves of resilience so that even when you have to go through this all the time, every day, because you have built these, it's almost like the neurons in your brain are firing differently. Mm -hmm. Because of that one act where you were able to do something and all of a sudden it wasn't as frustrating a situation, it was actually, oh, okay, the child calmed down because I was able to do something. Mm -hmm. That was one act. So look, I'm, I'm talking to everyone on this call. Look for the acts that you can do in the moment. You can't change the child screaming, but you can do something to remove the anger and the frustration, or at least not make it as unproductive. And what happened there was actually you looked because your brain opened up and you actually were thinking broader and you're able to use a particular strategy to calm the child down. It worked on your anxiety and things were better in the moment so i think my 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 sort of my last point on this particular thought while i'm holding this train of thought is that's what you need to begin to look for it's not about the event the event is external it's about you in the moment what can you do okay uh, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, we have one in from Sylvia. She says, how do, we, how, how do we deal with other stakeholders who don't seem to be concerned with helping the child to be independent? Uh, for example, 
when available, you try your best to teach the child something only to be dropped immediately. You're not around. And as our children are used to uh, more of routine, you are never start, you're ever starting over and over. So there is that loop of, uh, I, I, I believe, if I was to paraphrase it, it would be there now the support system. You're, you're not being aligned with your support system. They're not seeing the essence, maybe, of uh, the, the routine has to be followed. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Again, I can't talk about the external event. That's hmm. not the area that I deal with. I can't deal with how somebody acts. I can't deal with not getting support from a partner. I can't deal with that. What I can deal with is how I feel mm -hmm. from that partner not giving me the support, if I understood the question correctly. Mm -hmm. Let go. Letting go. Easy to say, but letting go. Finding the strength and the reserves within me to say, you know what, I've got this even if I don't have the support from you. Mm -hmm. Accepting the new normal. Now, again, I say that not in the sense of Okay, clearly what we're going through, people keep talking about accepting the new normal. But that's, I've begun to accept the fact that this is a situation we find ourselves in. It's fluid. And I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Making meaning out of the situation that I'm going through, which is difficult for me, and making meaning out of the situation that all of you are going through, or in which you've been going through all these many years as a caregiver. Okay? Loving more in order to heal. Developing gratitude practices. So that every day you say to yourself, I thank God for this and I thank God for this. That actually has a way of helping you, as I said, when you now are talking to somebody who is not giving you the support that you want. And you say to yourself, how can you be so insensitive? Actually, you've changed your mind because you did a gratitude practice all of that week. And that person not giving you that support is actually not that big of a deal. You have developed your reserves of resilience. You understand? It's the mm -hmm. things you do off the court, training in the gym. When you're now in the boxing ring or you're now on the basketball court or you're now on the football team or well, the football pitch, all of those hours of work that you did, training, practicing skills, drills, help you when you're in the moment. Okay. Okay, now let me just throw a bit of a spanner in the wax. We are all adults, right? And most of the time, uh, you will find um, the parents, the parents, uh, what? <laughs> all right. So most of the time, you find that we have, um, okay, we, we have a good number of people who are single parents over here, right? And maybe be going outside back in the days or going for maybe a random day used to make things feel a bit different. Okay. But now you can't move, you can't leave, you're alone in this space and loneliness comes in here. You have a child that you have to deal with, then you have your emotions as much as we're saying, put yourself first. But then there is that constraint. All right. Because most of the time you also see that people will always say that I'll be here to support you. Just call me but they never show up for you when you need them the most. So how do you deal with that? No, no, this is now the other emotion of, you are actually a human being who has feelings as an individual, leave alone all these external factors that are affecting you. But now the situation is this, I can deal with it, but I still need someone. How do you handle that? Okay, um, so, so we're sort of at the risk of uh, sounding like a broken record. I, I, I can't control somebody disappointing me. I can't. I can't control how somebody in my life will talk to me. I can't control that. I can control my reaction. I can control, I can work on, let me put that, I can work on how I feel about somebody disappointing me. Okay? And in fact, mine is not to change that person. Of course, I want them to change. But they will talk to me the way they want to. They will act towards me the way that they want to. I can't change that. What I can do is begin to find ways that I can express my thoughts. Because so a couple of questions have come, how we interact with somebody here. How do I express my thoughts in a manner that's emotionally intelligent, it's called emotional expression, to somebody who is constantly disappointing me or talks to me in a way that is um, unproductive, 
and in the context of we're dealing with this uh, child who has special needs. Emotional expression is expressing yourself in the right way, at the right time, to the right person. So how would I do that? That again is something that I have to find out for myself because if you say to yourself, you know what, this guy never is ever there for me. He never supports me. He never talks to me then. Because every time he says something, you feel so upset. You let those emotions take over and you say, you, you're useless. You never help me. How is that helping the situation? You need to be able to have a plan in place where you can have a conversation with that person. And the incumbent is not on him. The incumbrance is on you. Time, place, that is up to you. Everybody's situation is different. So what I would do is I would sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody and look at your particular circumstances. Okay, how can you express your feelings to this person in a way that makes them see that they are not giving you the support that you need? Okay. All right. So thank you very much. I'll just add one more now for the kids. In terms of um, the fact I mentioned earlier, there could be non-verbal. When we're talking about now engaging in terms of emotions, understanding my feelings, trying to understand, there is a time we are always advised to engage the children and try and understand how they feel. So how would you advise to, now this is as you as a caregiver, that communication to be able to understand what they are going through also, especially with the complexity. Okay. All right. So... Um, Dealing with uh, a child who has special needs is, 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 is so unique. For those of us who are parents, uh, it's hard enough having to talk to just uh, a, a child who doesn't have any special needs and being able to communicate with them at what, whatever age they are, particularly in this day and age that we live in. Mm -hmm. But now that added burden of they have special needs, mm -hmm. and I'm sure everybody on this call has had a lot of experience in that, how to interact with them. The only thing that I can add, because that's not my area of expertise, is my area of expertise is what's going on inside here. So figuring out what's going on inside the head of a special needs child, their thoughts and emotions at the time. And by the way, the things that you, I'm advocating that you do, Reframe the situation, telling yourself a different story, employing empathy when, you know, dealing with different people, removing your ego, being able to increase your emotional vocabulary. I would suggest that perhaps encourage that in your special needs child, mm -hmm. that writing down of those emotions. And then you sit down and say to yourself, okay, you felt really upset this time when you didn't get that toy. Okay. And you acted like this. What do you think you could have done differently? Okay. Why do you act like this? What do you want? You want that toy. And sort of going through that thought process of how the next time they are really upset because they're not able to play with the toy, that they can begin to think to themselves, okay, we had this conversation where maybe I shouldn't do this. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? I'm seeing Isaac, uh, I can't quite understand uh, his question. He says, especially if children want activities that can give our parents, uh, it's not clear. Uh, so I'll Sylvia, yes. I was asking, mm -hmm. at this time, what activities can we give to our special needs kids? In terms this of question. For, for, for building um, the emotional intelligence also and supporting them? or. Yes, and also supporting them at this time. This goes to the uh, this, this guy, the the speaker. Okay, Derek. Yes. Who is yours? Yeah, Isaac. I heard your question. So again, yes. I'm I'm not a special needs expert. I'm, I I. These special needs kids will have emotions just like you will have. Yes. The activities that you can do to build their emotional intelligence are like that one of expressing the emotional vocabulary. So you mm -hmm. can sit down and do an exercise where you say to yourself, okay, what have you felt? Mm -hmm. Begin to express yourself. That's an, yeah. that's a, a, an activity to build your emotional intelligence. 
Well, it was a, indeed a great session, and I concur about resilience and uh, as special needs caregivers, maybe one of the ways we can teach emotions to our children is using the same way we teach them alphabets, uh, where we have the letters and we ask them. So how about you just take a plain piece of paper, the same way we have emojis on our phones, and then you mimic an expression and then you show it on the image of which this em emotion that you're having as a facial expression, you show it to them so that they can relate with, or oh, this is when I'm feeling this way, you try and elaborate it, then the child will be able to relate that way when you have those emotions laid out next to them and you're trying to have a, a conversation about emotions and you ask how they're feeling i believe oh if you do it over and over the same way we do we, we do it with other things they'll be able to catch up because some words can be quite difficult for them to actually comprehend so let's do it the best way we know how and uh, and that way we'll be on the same page all of us both the caregivers and the children uh, we're coming to the end of our session and I'd like to say thank you very much for all the parents and to you Derek, thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't say thank you enough for sharing your views and for coming through and enlightening and empowering us so that we are able to know where we are, be authentic with ourselves, allow ourselves to feel, allow ourselves not to be the last on the to-do list or to take care of and to remember that we also matter as caregivers and that we should take care of ourselves too. And uh, from me to you, I want to remind you that no matter what people say, like Derek just said, yeah, you are the one who allows things to happen to you in terms of emotions. People's actions don't always have to affect how we feel, but how we react is what eventually will dictate the same. So always be conscious. Take your time. Take time off at the, at the end of the day and embrace what emotions you had in summary. And remember, you are very strong. You are too strong compared to every other person who's going through this right now because the advantage you have as a caregiver and a parent is you've been here before you have had isolation from the world you have been able to deal with meltdowns before you have been able to uh, adjust to social um, segregation for lack of a better word we have seen discrimination we've seen all these things it's the only sad part is like this time round it has been amplified but despite that, I'm sure we are stronger. And now we have been equipped but with skills and advice on how to do it best without losing yourself and still remaining in control. So I believe in all our awesomeness as caregivers, we shall be able to get through this and emerge victors at the end of it. So let us try and just put up goals of what we want to do, what emotional buildup we want to build, and uh, our resilience by the end of it will come out magnificent. So till next week, uh, we'll see you same place, same time. Same time, I've been your host, Sylvia Moramo Chavo from Andy Speaks. And always a pleasure spending the Saturday with you. So we'll see you next week as we go back to more of our children because we shall be alternating between the caregivers and the children in our series of special needs hangouts. So say hi to everyone. Love your kids. Put them first. Put you first, first, first. And enjoy the journey of being with them and set goals and build your resilience. So see you next week. Ciao.